As we sit here five days uh, after the end of the regular season, uh, just assess uh, 2010 Purdue football. Well, you know, my biggest disappointment, Tom, is that uh, our fans didn't get a chance to see the talent that was assembled in the spring and the preseason camp. Uh, I, I really felt that going into the end of the season, even with Ralph Bolden's uh, spring ACL injury, maybe that was an omen, you know, when you think back. But I really thought that, uh, and I think Danny and the staff felt that we would be very potent offensively. And that uh, biggest question marks really would have been the secondary and how it would uh, hold up. I, I don't think in our wildest imagination we ever envisioned the onslaught of of injuries that uh, that we experienced, but you know that's part of football too. When you evaluate, uh, how much do injuries? How much does youth play into to your evaluation? Well, I think you have to. I, I think you have to. When you look at football, you have to look over about a five or six year period of time because that's how long it takes you to develop a, a roster. And uh, you know, we put the succession plan in place in two thousand and eight. Because Joe Tiller and I both believed, and we made a number of, of changes, as fans will remember, in 2005, that we felt that the recruiting, while we had some quality people, certainly a Ryan Kerrigan is a quality uh, player, sure. uh, we felt that, that the overall depth and breadth of the, of the roster was not sufficient to compete for championships. And so we made those changes. And as, as Joe in, in neared the end of his career, we recognized that the, the, one of the things we want to be very careful about since we had really ramped up recruiting in, in uh, seven uh, and then again in eight, Joe's last year, we didn't want any disruption. The pipeline is, is starting to readjust, and it's a pipeline that we knew was in trouble back in five, six, and seven. So it, we knew it was going to manifest itself this time, but we really felt we could get over the hump. We thought we had a schedule that was conducive to... To, to creating a winning season and getting into postseason. And obviously that didn't happen. Talk about the improved uh, play, not only stopping the run, but also running the football, some of that predicated with, with the quarterback situation. But uh, the team became much more physical, which right. has not uh, been the case the last few years. Well, I, I think if you look at the defensive side of the ball, the young defensive tackles really improved. Kuwan Short was a freshman All-American as a sophomore. He got more consistent. Uh, it wasn't just one good play and then – play off he was he was more consistent and I think your defensive ends Ryan obviously had a, had a banner year and, and it'll be fun to put his banner up in the Mollenkopf now as the the next Purdue All-American um, I thought that we got we got reasonably good at linebacker as the season went on I thought as you added Will Lucas uh, to the mix I thought Beckford got more comfortable I think early in the in the season we had trouble with linebackers coming downhill which means running into the line and disrupting things and not reading and reacting. And against teams like Ohio State and Wisconsin and, and to some extent Michigan, that's critical. And these young defensive tackles, we were able to play Brandon Taylor, Josh Kishens, Pam file before he hurt his foot, um, Kiwan Short. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a good group. They got, or Gaston, I should have put him in there, and Ryan Isaac. They got better. And so that became, we, we, for the first time in, in a number of years, we're much more physical and we're able to contain the run. And then I think our secondary came along because we were able to do a lot of man on man coverage. So all of a sudden you get the Josh Johnsons and you get the Ricardo Allens. We lost a couple games with Albert and that hurt. When Albert Evans and Mike Ergel, who's a backup corner, went down, we got thin, had to bring in Namondo Harris, who's going to be a great cornerback. He's actually a little bigger than Josh Johnson. But there was a game, I think it was Michigan, where he was lost. And we got burned a couple of times because he just, he zigged when he should have zagged. But he got much better and played, played very, very well in the Indiana game. So, you know, the blessing in disguise defensively is a lot of these young guys did materialize. And our, our worst fears did not materialize. Offensively, we had to run the ball. Uh, the read-run option is always something that, that Danny and Gary Nord wanted to add to the spread offense because it really puts the linebackers in a, in a pickle. They've got, and the guys who want to come up and press coverage on you puts them in a, in, a, in a pickle. By necessity, we had to do that, probably more than we anticipated. But I've never seen an offense have to reinvent itself almost every week. Now, we had, after, after Robert went down, we had the bye week. And so we get Rob Henry in there, and you know, he's, he's probably the fastest guy on the team, or one of the fastest. He does a, they do a phenomenal job getting retooled to play Northwestern, who at that time, when Dan Persa was still healthy, was a top 25 ranked team. And they came back in the fourth quarter and they made the plays they had to to win the, win the game. And I thought, man, that's a really good sign. Came home, did what they should have done against Minnesota. 
I think we ran into Ohio State at the wrong time. I think they were embarrassed by what had happened at Wisconsin. And as Coach Katie said, it's not who you play, it's when you play them. Um, and, then, and then when Rob Henry went down, it was just devastating. Because I don't know that he would have made a difference in the Ohio State game. But he clearly, he, he was, he was mar marginally effective the rest of the season. He gave us everything he could do. But having said all that, even with all the injuries to Keith Smith and Justin Siller and, and uh, you know, Ralph Bolden and you go on and on, in the last four games, two of which were against teams that are in the top ten or, in, you know, tying for the Big Ten championship right now, we had to lead at halftime. They learned we couldn't throw the ball effectively, so the better teams kind of brought the people up in the box. But, boy, Michigan State and Indiana are two games I think we're going to kick ourselves for not finishing. And that's a danger. When a team starts to learn how to lose, that's a, that's a problem, and that's something we're going to have to carry into the off season as we as we go forward. But you know, on balance, uh, I, I I've never seen again a team has to reinvent itself each week offensively, let alone three times within a game. It's almost impossible to do. And I thought they did a great job. Pan, fans saw players running on and off, and were what are they doing? We had different packages because sure. we knew we were going to try to maximize the strengths. We moved out Tariq McBurse from running back, where we we think he'll be a very capable running back because we had no big slot receivers. So, you know, again, it was a chess match. And, uh, you know, early in, the, in each game, we were more effective. As the game went on, people figured out what you were doing, and they, they made their adjustments. And everybody said, why didn't we make adjustments? Well, we adjusted what we could. Right. Two other aspects of the program that are important to all the programs at Purdue, developing scholars, developing citizens, and certainly high marks in both those areas uh, for football. Well, it is, and, and I, you know, I've always been a proponent that if, if kids are giving a marginal effort in a classroom, you're going to get a marginal performance in, in competition. And Danny has, has really subscribed to that. It was one of the points when we interviewed him that was strong. He says, I'm not going to bring any guy to Purdue who's going to be satisfied with being average in any aspect of his career. And uh, Academically, uh, we inherited, he inherited a pretty good situation from Joe. We were, our cumulative uh, GPA at that time for football was about 264 or 5. He's pushed it up over 285, and in fact, it may be closer to 29, which is very, very close to the all male average on this campus. And he's not done. I mean, his objective is to try to drive the system towards a 3.0. I think when kids feel good about what they're doing academically, they feel better about themselves in life, and I think they manifest itself in the optimal performance on the field. So I feel very good about the things that he's, he's done in that area and doesn't take any excuses. In the same way he doesn't take excuses for our play, he, he takes no excuses for the academics. They've got to perform. And he's, he's continued what Joe started, and that was to portray these kids in a more human way. So the, the boiler bridge walk, uh, the, the, the meet the team picnic were important. But it was also important to get these kids to realize that giving back to the community, don't always be a taker, be a giver. So, you know, you see the, the annual blood drive, the cancer run walk challenge, the, the hammering with hope where we build a, a habitat house to name a few, are good examples of getting these kids out to realize, hey, you got a heck of an opportunity, use it. And, and where you can give back, be seen as being gracious. And uh, so I give, him, I give him good marks in, in both of those areas and have been pleased with it. Final question, what are your expectations for 2011? What should fans' expectations be? We, we very clearly have the capacity to be a winning football team in 2011. I thought we had that, that capacity this year. We ought to see ourselves in postseason. Now, injuries are always going to happen. And if you're relatively healthy, even this year, I would have envisioned us going on to a bowl game. But, but I didn't envision, and I don't think any fan who's, who's a true fan of Purdue football has ever seen the, the rash of injuries. I will tell you this, in, in the, the time that I've been here, I think we've gone through eight or nine starting quarterbacks, roughly 200 football games. As best I can remember, there were two, two starts by Kyle Orton where he had a hip injury where the starter didn't start. I have every expectation uh, that we're going we're gonna to have a little bit of a, this is a bitter pill. I, I don't like to lose the bucket and haven't lost it too many times since I've been here. So, you know, it's going to be one of those little hurts in our stomach all during the uh, camp, but it's going to be a reminder of what we don't want to have happen again. We can't control uh, what the good Lord is going to do to us from a physical standpoint. But if, if the things are within our control, this team ought to be a winning team next year, ought to put itself in the postseason. You know, a lot of things can happen, uh, but, but we're going to be a be in a better situation next year when you look at the roster. We've got 16 starters out of 22 coming back. It's a lot better situation this year. We were, we were, we were a little closer to about 50-50. I, I think we're progressing. 
I, I want to reiterate, our goal is to win a Big Ten championship and try to play as high up in the, at BCS as we can. I, I'm not satisfied with postseason, but you have, to, you have to set incremental milestones. We haven't been there for three years. So we need to get back to where that's a routine and build from there and, and go forward, and uh, that's what we're going to do.